somebody who's here today emailed me this morning and said, I'm looking forward to your soil song. And I was like, oh, you mean the one that I'm about to write? Because <laughs> yeah, there wasn't one yet. two verses, just kind of over text, and my daughter came up with one of the lines that I needed, and so I was thinking if anybody has ideas for a song about butterflies, or <laughs> geology, uh, or bumblebees, feel free to email me with ideas, because we can write songs via email together. <laughs> should I present for soil science? How much do you guys already know on hand? So I'm going to just hit on some of the big um, ticket items for soil science. We'll talk about the soil forming factors. We'll talk about inherent versus dynamic soil quality and how we can use those in land management applications. Uh, we'll move on to soil taxonomy and then a conceptual model of how to use soil science and land management uh, that was developed by a couple of mentors of mine. Um, then we'll take a break after that. That's kind of pretty heavy, uh, so we'll give you a break after that, and then we'll come back 
And then we'll talk about some of my favorite stuff. Uh, soil memory, what it tells us about the history of a landscape, how we can use that in land management planning. And then we'll look at a case study of how I use the conceptual model for using soil science and land planning um, to our forest restoration project up at Mount Hall um, with Forest Service. And I introduced it uh, in our NEPA planning process. So, um, it was pretty cool and we were really successful at it. So, um, everything I'm presenting here, um, my mentors, Terry Craig and Karen Bennett, uh, really wrote a nice paper back in 2015. It's called Soil Matters um, paper. Um, so if you're interested in reading further about this topic, I highly recommend um, taking, a, this, taking a look at this. Uh, you can Google it. It's public access. It was done with taxpayer-funded dollars, so you guys contributed to this study. So please read it. All right, so the five soil forming factors. These are universal on this planet on anywhere, any, any continent that you go. Um, different planets uh, out in the universe might have different soil forming factors, but as far as we know in this, in this planet, we have five. Climate, uh, that um, you think of it like uh, the difference from weathering down around the equator versus the weathering that we have up here in more temperate climates. It's slower weathering process generally here. We have cold seasons versus always a warm season. Down in the um, tro tropics, the biological activity is constantly going, whereas up here right now, that biological activity in the soil is lying dormant. So that um, factors in with weathering processes. So that's the climate portion of it. O for organisms, uh, that's my favorite part of soil biology. Um, you have just millions and billions of different arthropods, insects, a lot of us think about like worms and uh, burrowing rodents and things like that, but more importantly are bacteria and mycorrhizae. It's without fail, I think it's something like 92% of land plants have some sort of association with mycorrhizae. So it is the rule, it's not the exception. There would have been no colonization of land without mycorrhizae. It just wouldn't have happened. It's pretty interesting stuff and really, the new um, interesting research that's coming out in soil science centers around a lot of the soil biology stuff, so it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and then relief. Uh, relief is north slope versus south slope, you can think of that. Um, in this county we have the dry south facing slopes that are usually dominated by sagebrush, grasses, forbs, and if you look on those north slopes they're generally dominated by forests, right? And you probably have seen this before and didn't realize that the relief effect and how that changes soil development and plant um, uh, propagation and development as well. So that's the relief part. Parent material. Soils like humans, they have parents, they come from somewhere. Um, this picture here is from Okanagan County. It has two parent materials associated with it below the red line. All this cobbly, gravelly looking material is glacial till that was deposited by the continental glacier at the end of the last ice age, late Pleistocene. And above that is volcanic ash. Um, you'll hear me talk about this a lot, ash capped soils in the Pacific Northwest. They're very unique to the Northwest part of the United States. They don't occur anywhere else in the lower 48 other than the, the Pacific Northwest. And then the ring of fire around the Pacific is primarily where we see these volcanic ash cap soils. So that when I talk about parent material, that's what I'm talking about. And we'll talk about different parent material as um, the presentation goes on. And then the non-variable factor is time. It just takes time to weather rock to soil. Um, the vast majority of our soils are not weathered from rock. They're actually transported materials, whether that be wind, water, ice, there's various mechanisms to transport soil. About 25% of our soils develop in place, and that's the weathering process from rock to soil. Our best estimate on the research that we have available to us today, it takes about 500 years to weather rock down to one inch of soil. So we generally view soil as a non-renewable resource, and we need to really take care of the productive soil that we have. And we'll talk about soil BMPs and how we protect that through management activities. And you can easily remember these five soil forming factors with the CORP acronym. See, right? <laughs> CL for climate, O for organisms, relief, parent material, and time. You're going to remember that, ain't you? When you leave <laughs> CLORP. That's how I learned it. So, inherent soil quality. Inherent soil quality is, was best defined as the soil's basic capacity to perform different soil functions that support a variety of resource objectives. And the most uh, popular ones that uh, come to mind are soil color, 
soil texture, clay content, uh, and different types of horizon thickness. So these are horizons when I talk about soil horizons. O, organic layer, A, B, and C. Soil scientists are really creative when we talk about horizons. But they don't have to necessarily happen in this A, B fashion. Um, I'll show you a soil that doesn't have an A horizon because it's so young, and it just has an O right to a B, and then B, W. And anyway, I could keep going on the soil taxonomy. I want the point is, it doesn't always fit the A, B, C um, soil horizon model. And these inherent soil qualities are generally not significantly altered by our land management actions. The one that I can think of that does come to mind is changing soil color by organic additions. Um, and this is more prevalent in Europe and Asia where they've been amending the soil with organic additions, primarily livestock organic additions for thousands of years. And that changes the organic matter of the soil and it also changes the color. So we can change these inherent uh, quality characteristics of the soil, but we generally don't but they can happen. Um, this is at the Triple Creek site. And this is actually a pretty cool example locally of the different horizonation um, and the different parent materials that have come in over time. Um, so these would each be their own distinct horizon. Um, you have coarse material here and here and then finer sediments around. So it was just kind of a nice picture to kind of highlight the horizonation, how it can be really different. Um, and it just tells the different story of like a flood plan. Each one of those would tell a different story of each flood event because it would have different sediment and different paramaterial types that you could trace back up the watershed to where they came from. And you could figure out and tell that story. Is there ash in there as well? Correct, there is. Um, probably the stuff that is white in this county is either going to be volcanic ash or it'll be soil that has calcium carbonate deposits in it. Generally speaking, those would be the two white forms of, in the soil that we would have here in the county. So yes, there is volcanic ash there. And then uh, mollusols for inherent soil quality. We're going to be talking about this a little later on. Um, we use the Monsell soil charts. And really, soil color is an indicator of soil health and the different soil organisms that are there. So the, these Monsell soil charts we use quite a bit in um, field descriptions of soils. And we also use the field book for describing and sampling soils that the NRCS has put out. I think it's on its third version. They're going to put out a fourth version here in another year or two. And the point of having this bullet up here is it does vary. Soils are very, they just are variable inherently on the landscape. So they can have different modifiers associated with them and they could be a little bit lighter color, but they would fall under the same um, soil order. So they're just, it's the science that we've used to describe the different variabilities that are found in soil. So I just kind of wanted to show you guys that and give you a, an idea of what we deal with out on, 